Hey, welcome to the Mike Santiago Show presented by Compassion International. On today's episode, we have the founder of Theos U, Nathan Finocchio, a great theologian and a great follow on Instagram. We're going to be talking about the six lids that every leader faces and a lot more. So stay tuned. Welcome to the show. I would like to highlight a ministry that I have loved for years, Compassion International. Compassion is an incredible organization that's all about releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. They are currently serving over 2 million children and their families in some of the most poverty-stricken areas of the world. And here's my favorite part. All of this is happening in local churches. Compassion is all about equipping the local church so that every single child is cared for by leaders in their community. As a pastor, I found Compassion to be a strategic part of our global mission strategy. As a church, we incorporated Compassion into our focus in on Guatemala. Compassion made it easy for everyone in our church to put their faith in action by caring for children in need. I would encourage any pastor listening to learn more about Compassion. You can help equip local churches around the world while seeing your church grow in the process. All you have to do is visit Compassion.com slash Mike. That's Compassion.com slash Mike to learn more. Hey, welcome to the Mike Santiago Show presented by Compassion International. If we've never had a chance to meet, I just want to say thanks for tuning in today. Hit that subscribe, hit that like, hit all the things, comment down below. Would love to hear all about what you're thinking about in today's episode. We're going to be talking about the six lids every leader faces. And as we face those leadership lids, uh, I trust you're going to be taking notes. Maybe you can walk or journey alongside your staff or your team on this content. We have an incredible interview with my friend Nathan Finocchio from Theos U. Many of you have probably followed him on Instagram. Some of you might even be subscribers to Theos U content, Theos Seminary. It's an incredible interview, so stay tuned for that. But I just want to thank our sponsors again, Compassion International, Overflow.co, The Rocket Media. As we dive into today's episode, let me introduce myself and just say I'm glad that you're here. When I was 24 years old, we packed up everything that we owned and we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina with nothing. We had just a dream in our hearts and a vision on our on our spirits. God had called us to plant a life giving church. And over the past 10 years, God, it, God has done something that we could have never predicted. It is nothing short of a miracle. We've gone from seven people in our living room to now over a thousand in attendance on the weekend, three campuses across all, uh, all across the city. And uh, we love what God is doing here at our church. And what we've, what we've decided to do is create this show to help leaders from all over the world navigate through some of the challenges that they face. We also came to provide quality content that brings value to your team. And so again, thank you so much for listening. Every single show, you're going to hear an interview with a thought leader, a, a, a leader in the church, a leader in business that will help you take your leadership to the next level. As I've been leading this church for 10 years, I've recognized that there are six lids that every leader faces. And these six lids that every leader faces are so important to recognize and then take action steps uh, to be able to overcome them. And so I'm just going to jump right into these six lids of leadership. If you're taking notes today, the first lid that every leader faces is, this is what I've discovered, myself. I am the greatest limiting factor when it comes to my church or organization's potential to grow. If I don't have the self-awareness to understand that I am the limiting factor, then I'll never grow beyond who I am. So the greatest lid in most leaders' lives is themselves. The hardest person to convince to change isn't my board. The hardest people to convince to change isn't my congregation. The hardest person to convince to change is sometimes myself. And so I would audit my daily activities. I would audit my habits. I'd audit my process, my thinking, my leadership to see where the blind spots are in my own life life. See, I love the ability to understand where my weak points are, where my blind spots are so that I can get better. Because when I get better, everyone around me gets better. And when everyone around me gets better, my organization gets better. But I can't start pointing fingers to others until I've really done self-evaluation on my own leadership. So what is the lid 
on my leadership. That's really myself. Am I uh, doing the right things at the right time with the right tone? Am I equipping my team to do things that they've been called to do? I am sometimes the greatest lid on my leadership. So what are you doing to improve your leadership? What are you doing to grow your leadership? The first thing you're doing is you're listening or watching to today's episode. So I commend you for having the confidence and the ability to see that your leadership is what needs to lift, that you, myself, I, myself, am the greatest lid on my organization. But when I get better, everyone around me gets better. So the first lid is myself. The second lid is my staff. I know this, sometimes you got the people on the right bus, but they're on the wrong seat. And it just takes one challenging confrontation, one good conversation, one uh, meeting that could help adjust the uh, seats on the bus so that your team can be better equipped. A lot of times I meet guys who have the, they have the vision, they have the mindset, and they have the self-leadership, but they don't have the staffing. They don't have the right team around them. Listen, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. And one of the limiting factors on many organizations is not just the leader themselves, but it's the staff or the volunteer team that they have. So you need to audit your team and say, is this team all in the right place? Are they all getting the maximum potential of God's calling on their life? Is my team right? Because if my team is not right, I will severely be limited by the growth potential in our organization if we don't get the staff right. So myself and my staff are the first two lids that I would audit, first looking inwardly and then looking in your inner circle. You don't realize the potential that your staff holds to dictate or or actually they, 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 don't, they have the potential to change and to make better the entire organization. But if you have one wrong team member, one negative team member, one staff member that just always is creating problems, you know this because you're going through the Rolodex in your mind right now of people who are currently making life difficult for you, you need to know that your staff can be a lid. So first lid is myself. The second lid is my staff. The third lid is this, my systems. Man, uh, you are only going to grow at the strength of your systems. Let me say that one more time. You will only grow at the strength, strength of your systems. I've met so many guys. They are uh, incredible communicators, but they don't build systems. They can't build systems, and systems are what sustain the growth of the church. I was recently talking with a pastor a couple hours away from here, and he said, listen, we have realized that the quality of our leaders doesn't have to be as high as it used to be as long as the quality of the system is great. So you'll get to a point in your organization where you will no longer be able to hire out the talent that sustains the growth. You will have to build the infrastructure, the system that sustains the growth. I met so many guys who have a great passion to reach their city, a great passion to grow their business, a great passion, but their, their passion uh, ends where their systems fall short. And if you don't build systems that can operate without you, if you don't document and have uh, basically, a, we call it a rapture report, a binder full of every system that you've created, if you don't have a system for first-time guests as they come into the door, if you don't have a system to check in kids and to keep them safe in the kids' ministry, if you don't have a system to follow up with first-time guests, or if you don't have a system to follow up with new believers or disciple new believers, uh, systems are what will sustain growth. You can get growth from charisma, but you sustain growth from your systems. And so do you have a system to follow up with first-time givers? Do you have a system that increases generosity and fundraising? So myself, my staff, and my systems, those are the first three lids of leadership. The next lid of leadership is my structure. Does everyone report to you? Is it chaotic? If I were to ask you to uh, draw up an org chart on a whiteboard really quickly. Is it clear who reports to who? Is it clear what who does what, when they do it, and who they report to when there's a problem? Or does everything point to you? Our church grew the quickest when we established a structure. Uh, I tell guys all the time, I haven't been to a staff meeting in years. Why? Because our structure 
doesn't include me or my influence in our staff meeting. Our structure simply has me communicating vision to the top level executives of our, of our organization. And then from there, the structure takes care of itself where there's other layers to the organization. Maybe your organization hasn't grown to that point yet, but you need to prepare an org chart that creates a structure where not everything relies too heavily on you. When everything relies on you, everything falls apart when you aren't there. But when you build a structure that exists outside of you, the organization will grow because, here's why, because you've built a structure that is bigger than yourself. I would venture to say that you probably can't manage more than seven people at the most. I can't even manage four people. Our team is only three people underneath me. Why? Because we built a structure that is sustainable and not everyone goes to the same person for answers to questions. Instead, we distribute and uh, diminish the responsibility on every single person. And that is our structure. So myself, my staff, my systems, my structure. Number five, my stewardship. What are you doing with the resources that you have? If you're getting funny with the money, then the chances of you growing are very slim. Why? Because uh, you can't build beyond the capacity of your stewardship. If you're not managing resources well, if you're not uh, looking at expense reports, if you don't have a, a really good idea of profit and loss and, and P&L statements and the balance sheet, if you're just kind of far removed from stewardship, then what you will find is that eventually you'll be spending and burning cash on things that are not even part of the mission anymore. So it's imperative that you audit. The lid of your leadership could be the lack of stewardship in your organization. Have you sat down with a financial advisor? Have you sat down with your bookkeeper? Have you sat down with the person that's keeping your books? Have you sat down with your board? Have you sat down with your CFO or however you have it structured? Have you, have you audited your stewardship? Because I know that stewardship is a huge limiting factor. I meet guys all the time that as soon as they get their money right, as soon as they get their stewardship right, they end up increasing their church. They end up increasing their business. Why? Because they found the burn. They found where it's been wasted. They found where they've been spending. They, they started cutting and trimming the fat and they end up stewarding God's resources so much better. And people trust you more when you steward better. It's incredible how the offering goes up when my stewardship goes up, when I learn to manage the finances and the resources that have come to me better then I understand that that was a lid that was on my organization. Quick recap, myself, my staff, my systems, my structure, and my stewardship. Last but not least is my spirit. What are you carrying when you walk into the room? Do you light up the room or are people scared? I'll be very vulnerable with you. There was a time in my leadership where my staff had a different name for me depending on how I showed up. To, to work that day. If I showed up with a angry spirit or a frustrated spirit or a negative spirit, then they would call me by a different name. They would say, hey, everyone, so-and-so showed up today. They would actually say my name in Spanish. They'd say, Miguel has showed up today. And that meant to them that the spirit that I was carrying wasn't a friendly one. The spirit that I was carrying wasn't a loving one. The spirit that I was carrying wasn't one of leadership. And I, it was one of immaturity. It was one of pride. It was one of leading from fear and not from faith. And so I would audit the spirit that you're walking around the room in. Is, you, is your held, head held high? Are you walking in the room with, with faith to believe that God is going to do what he said he was gonna do in your organization? Are you loving on the team that God has given you with, with love, not just by paying them, not just by giving them benefits, but instead with your spirit? Are you an encouraging spirit when you walk into the room or are you a discouraging spirit? Are people running and hiding when you walk into a room or are people attracted to your leadership because of the spirit that you carry. It's interesting. When you change your spirit, it lifts the lid on your staff. When you change your spirit, it lifts the lid on your systems. When you change your spirit, it lifts the lid on your structure. When you change your spirit, it lifts the lid on your stewardship. So when you go to look at yourself as the limiting factor, I would, I would actually dial it in on your spirit. Are you, are you smiling when you don't have to? Do, do people catch you uh, just laughing and having a good time? Or are they nervous to approach you? Do they feel like they have to make an appointment to speak to you? Are you unapproachable as a leader? That all has to do with the spirit that you carry. So as a leader in this room today, I would encourage you to audit these six 
lids. Myself, my staff, my systems, my structure, my stewardship, and my spirit. Let's face it, fundraising is hard, and 90% of U.S. wealth is tied up in non-cash assets. This means that churches only accepting cash donations are missing massive giving potential. Overflow is here to help. Overflow is an online software that empowers donors to give crypto and stock donations to churches and nonprofits within minutes. The average donation to church and nonprofits is currently $128, but the average donation through Overflow is $10,000. Your donors want to give stock and crypto because it's the most tax efficient way to give. Why? Because there's no capital gains tax. So churches get the full donation, donors get the full tax deduction, and as a result, churches have seen up to 32 times return on their investment with Overflow. Let's unlock unprecedented generosity together. All you have to do is visit overflow.co slash Mike. That's overflow.co slash Mike today. Hey, on each episode of the podcast, we take some time and we take one of your questions that comes from our Facebook listener page. So be sure to go on over to Facebook and find the page and like it. Uh, Today's question comes from a youth pastor. He says, why does my senior pastor hate me? (laughs) Why does my senior pastor hate me? I'm not laughing at you. Uh, I just understand the nature of that question and it's got layers to it. I have been a youth pastor. I have been in a a struggling church. I've submitted to uh, leadership that was challenging to work for. And now I'm in the senior pastor seat and I have a youth pastor. Not only do I have a youth pastor, but I have four children that I take to youth group every single week. So I have customer feedback immediately after the Wednesday night service. So here's how to really kind of work on the the relationship between your senior pastor and, and, and the youth pastor. And this would work across the board, any department. So it doesn't have to be just the youth pastor today. Maybe you're a worship guy. Maybe you're an associate. Maybe you're the kids person. Uh, whatever it is that you do, this would actually would work even if you're in a corporate setting or the marketplace where with your boss. There's probably pockets of time where your boss is more relational than at other times. There's probably pockets of time during the week where the work is the workload is so heavy that they're not interested in chit chat. They're not interested in talking at the water cooler. They're not interested in hearing about problems or, or meeting together. But there are probably pockets of time where the workload is less and the demand is lower and you can probably gain traction and build trust. Trust is basically the foundational issue here. You feel hated by your senior leader because the trust between the two of you has not been bridged. It hasn't been built. So how do we gain trust with the person that is our boss? Is essentially the question. We we find the pockets of time during the week where the workload is at lower demand. Sometimes that's on a Friday as everyone's wrapping up. You can maybe get a little bit of extra time there. Sometimes it's at the beginning of the week before everything gets too hectic. I don't know what your context might be, but the chances of, of your senior leader having a lunch meeting or a coffee meeting where he's got a lot less demand on his time, maybe a lot less distraction, I would try to find those pockets of time. There's probably some sort of activity that they do as a hobby that you could also try to infiltrate and gain trust through. That's whether that's on the golf course, pickleball court, going to a ball game. I don't know what they are. Those are just some examples of activities. But if you find yourself with a lack of trust with your senior leader, what I would do is I would try to do an activity with them to not have some corporate uh, kind of stale sit down meeting that feels like too professional. What you want to do is find the times when the guard is down, when it doesn't feel such like a corporate relationship, such like a boss to employee relationship. And that's going to build trust with your senior leader. This works for me. Uh, On Mondays, we all go to lunch together. My guard is down. We're having a good time. We're laughing and we are uh, cherishing our our friendship. We're becoming a family. I also love to play golf. And so I'll take some of the guys on the golf course with me. And it's those times where we build trust. If it's, if I only interact with you corporately, if I only interact with you on Sunday mornings during church or Wednesday nights during church, if I only ever talk to you during staff meeting, then you're never going to build the trust you need. So you need to build relational equity. And that takes time. It also takes auditing your boss's schedule to make sure that you're finding the right pocket of time to build that trust. Hey, I just want to build some trust with you. Can we go out to lunch? Hey, whenever you're free, whenever there, when I know you're busy, but whenever you're free, I'd love to, you know, hit some golf balls at the driving range. If you're doing an activity 
a lot of times guard guards get put down and trust gets built up. Hope that helps you today. And if you want to submit more questions, all you have to do is head on over to our listener Facebook page. The first thing someone does when they show up to your city is they type the word church in Google on their phone and your website needs to be the very first one that shows up, especially on Google ads, not on page two. And the ad grant does not help you get on page one. So contact my friends at the rocket.media forward slash church. Mention us as a thank you for signing up and you will get some free AirPods. That's the rocket.media forward slash church rocket.media forward slash church. Very grateful for their partnership. And I love how they leverage the power of the internet. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mike Santiago show sponsored by Compassion International. I'm here with Nathan Finocchio. He's one of the brothers behind uh, this incredible online resource, uh, Theos U, Theos Seminary. There's a ton of training going on. I've been a subscriber now for uh, three or four years and my entire staff walks through it. Our entire church uses it for our small groups and I'm incredibly grateful uh, for his voice in the local church and the space of uh, theological training and uh, very grateful for the Instagram presence. It always brings a great laugh and uh, a great joy to my heart to see someone who is passionate about uh, Christian nationalism, someone who's passionate about making sure that the church uh, stays uh, sacred and special and makes an impact. And I'm very, very grateful to have you on the show today and uh, super stoked to have you. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Um, give me kind of the rundown. Take me back to like six months before you launched this e-learning platform. What were you thinking? Why, why did you think that that was a need and where did the idea come from? So I was in New York and um, I was on staff at a, a church there and um, I was uh, teaching, you know, basically abbreviated Bible college courses um, to about 250, 300 students on, on a Monday night. And most of them had never darkened the doors of a church. They had absolutely no concept of Christianity. They'd put their hand up, you know, at a, at a Sunday service. Um, and so they wanted to kind of explore more of their faith. Um, and maybe some of them were trying to, um, Hillsong, New York city was the church that I was at for eight years. And, um, and then, um, you know, we, you know, we're preaching and, uh, uh, many of them didn't have any training. Um, and, um, theological training isn't all, um, I think it's a big, it's a, it's a bigger deal than we let on. Um, I think that the way that we measure success can oftentimes be faulty. Um, you don't need a theological degree to grow a huge church. Okay. Um, but you might need a theological degree or to have studied formally or, you know, um, in some, in some manner to have a, a, a faithful biblical church. Um, is what I'm starting to see. Um, so, you know, I, you know, well, none of the disciples, you know, had a theological degree Yeah. So they spent day after day with Jesus Christ. Right. Um, they went to a three and a half year long school uh, called the Jesus school. Um, and Jesus was a rabbi. He was the greatest teacher ever. Um, it was a live in, um, you know, internship meets, you know, PhD program. Um, and, you know, Peter, who was a fisherman, um, and probably a rabbinic school dropout, some people would suggest, uh, you know, then is able to write the kind of literature <laughs> that he writes later right. on. Um, so obviously the guy was heavily influenced, um, by this Jewish rabbi, um, and, you know, so, so I, I just started to see that need, uh, for people who are in, in ministry. And doing ministry, particularly in my uh, my movement, I'm a charismatic, um, and I sort of I I know the charismatic, particularly Pentecostal charismatic evangelical stream. Um, you know, that's 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 what I'm acquainted with. Those are the circles that I run in, and um, and so I just kind of saw that that you know there's guys that needed needed training and. Um, but some of the training was uh, maybe too expensive or maybe it was, 
exhausting and uh, maybe done, uh, maybe emphasizing certain things that they didn't need uh, and not emphasizing things that they did need. I, you know, uh, I think it was Chesterton that said that, you know, in order to be, you, you need to have an education to have some suspect, uh, to be somewhat some suspect of education. And so I have some education. I have a bachelor of theology from a independent charismatic school. Um, so I have enough education to be dangerous and to be suspect of education. You know, I remember uh, being at Bible school and thinking, you know, some of these classes are absolutely amazing. And some of these classes are absolutely trash. And uh, <laughs> um, so I wanted to create a theological experience where every class was engaging for somebody who is theologically inclined um, or ministry inclined. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's what we've gone and done. So we, you know, myself and my brother and some of my friends who I really, really respect their method um, because our school is big on method. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just about what you believe. It's about how you got there because if right. I can teach you how to get there, then you can get anywhere. Um, and um, so we created, you know, Theos U of course, and, and we are unapologetically charismatic. Um, awesome. We're, unapologetically conservative in that we are des we desire to conserve historic christian orthodoxy um uh and um yeah and and then we're 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 ridiculously affordable um right. and so that's 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 kind of, kind of the need the need was i was in new york i saw a lot of pastors that needed this and then of course i you know being in new york i'm canadian in Canada, we have we have uh, poverty in Canada, um, but probably not to the degree um, or the concentration that um, America has. I don't think that America has, you know, third world poverty, but um, but all that to say, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people in America that that, that wouldn't be able to afford Netflix um, uh, or 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 afford a you know the school that I went to. Um, Portland Bible College, um, you know, there's a lot of students that wouldn't be able to afford that. And it wasn't even that expensive. And I grew up in a pretty, you know, broke uh, Christian pastor's home. My parents weren't able to really help me. They, I think they were able to, they, they, my, my parents paid for my flight to and from Portland. Um, and I think my dad used like his points from his credit card or something. But so, uh, you know, it, it was quite costly for us. It's not even that costly. Um, so just imagine a kid who, you know, doesn't have a, uh, access at all, you know, and, and is really reliant on government funding or government loans, but you can't get a loan for this type of school. You have to kind of pay for it. So, uh, my thought was just to create something that's just, it's excellent and it's affordable. Um, and, uh, it's, a, and, 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 and then as such, it's a bit disruptive. So that's kind of our, our aim. We're doing that same thing now with, Theos Seminary, which is our Bible college. So we have a four-year program at Theos Seminary, and we're launching a master's program in January, um, and then, God willing, a PhD program in the fall of next year. And this will all be for cents on the dollar comparatively right. to other programs where you would do an MTH and a PhD. Um, so yeah, man, that's, that's what I'm passionate about. I, I think that education is really important. I think that the advent of, um, you know, secular humanism has been completely by design. Um, all the hippies who, who dodged the draft, um, you know, they all became professors and they run all the universities now. Right. Um, and they have, they have been really successful in implementing um, their national vision for America. Um, everybody has a national vision uh, for their country. Um, and the secular humanists are absolutely nationalists. Right. And, um, and so uh, they've been really successful and, and they've, you know, they've, they've, they've schooled uh, the Jesus out of uh, American kids and, and um, American thinkers. And um, so I think that it's time for the church 
you know, to really uh, begin to sandbag um, and train. And education is more important than, than I think it's ever been. I think that pastors who are thinking about launching another campus should launch a school. Um, and they should, you know, do a K through 12. And because uh, now's the time, you know, to, to, to educate, uh, to be so, to, to take education seriously. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of my story. And that's, that's what I'm up to. That's awesome. Well, uh, again, thank you for your time. You mentioned your dad, you know, he grew up, you grew up in a pastor's home. I'm third generation assemblies of God. So I fully am uh, aware of kind of the vein that maybe you guys were in. Uh, take me back to your childhood growing up as a pastor's kid. There's a lot of pastors watching this who have children who would love for their kids to grow up, uh, you know, people of the faith, learn and follow Christ for the rest of their lives. What are some key components to your childhood you think your dad implemented early on that you would say, man, that really made a difference, and that's why I'm here today? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, my dad... Um, my dad was not a, a perfect dad because there are no perfect dads. Um, but dad demonstrated hard work um, when he was not in the ministry and he demonstrated hard work when he was in the ministry. Um, I, I woke up every day to the sound of my dad speaking in tongues mm. down in the basement Same. doing his devotions, you know, like that's every morning. My, I'd see my dad, like when he was in the ministry, he didn't sleep in. He woke up before everybody else spoken tongues for an hour, you know, prayed, and then he'd do his devotions. Um, and we knew not to, not to interrupt, like not, don't even think about it, you know, like dad's doing his thing. Um, and, um, so my dad is just the real deal. He's a hardworking, uh, my dad, you know, he's a, he's a purist. Um, so, you know, like he's, he's a no compromise guy, like just absolutely no compromise. So, um, he, I'll give an example, like, um, with money, you know, like nothing in our house was ever done because of money. My dad has never done anything because of money. He's never taken a job because of money. He's never gone anywhere because of money. Um, to the point that he's fallen on his sword, um, you know, right. which really irked me, you know, um, but he's, he's big on integrity and, um, and so um, I learned that and I, and I, you know, like I really believe that he believes what he believes, you right. know, <laughs> so um, same guy in the pulpit as the guy on a Monday, you know, and uh, once again, dad's not, my dad was not perfect. My, there are no perfect dads, um, but he was real and he really, he really prays and he really knows the scriptures and he really did his best to build his life um, that way. You know, my parents, my parents put me in, they sacrificed to put us in, in Christian education. Uh, we went to a tiny little church school um, called Living Hope Christian Academy. Uh, it was just a local church school that, that ran um, ACE. Yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, these curriculum. Little... Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, exactly. The pace and ACE. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So we just, just like a, it's like a Christian, you know, uh, curriculum out of like a Baptist, you know, here we are, we were like charismatics. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we were doing Baptist curriculum and, um, but, but really good stuff, you know? So, uh, we did that. And, and then I, I finished my last two years of high school because my dad moved, we, our family moved and my dad took a church, um, in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Um, and I finished high school, you know, at a, at a public high school and, and absolutely loved it, like flourished. Um, but uh, the, the foundations had been laid, you know, really, really well. So we, we had a, we had a strong sense of who we were because we were always in church. We were always in school and there was just never an opportunity for my identity. Uh, you know, my, 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 my family identity. Uh, my religious identity to ever be questioned. Um, right. And even in, you know, even when in, in the years when I kind of sowed my wild oats, so to speak, and um, uh, which would be just, you know, cha uh, 
just just um I don't know how I'd, I'd explain it. I, I've never had a deconstructing moment or a moment where I wasn't, you know, a Christian, but there's definitely been years where I didn't know what to do, if that sure. makes sense, or sure. you know, just figuring myself out, um, you know, and, 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 uh, but, you know, all throughout the years, um, my, you know, my parents gave me an identity and I'm really thankful for it. And so I think that the best thing that parents can do is, is is gift and 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 foster an identity you know and you give that to your kids um and uh rather than their identity be given to them by someone else uh because bottom line is, is that humans are mimetic in terms of how we learn we learn from people we learn socially and there is no such thing as an individual uh it's, it's just an absolute and total fabrication um mostly we are the sum of our parents our history um uh, you know our our cult our religion and um and the, you know the, the the liberated individual is just it's a it's a it's a lie it's it's not totally true um it's an illusion mostly um and i think that the individual or the the, the per, i believe in the individual and i believe in the person but i believe that that's really found in uh i think it's better found rather in history better found in family better found in your nation better found in your religion um then outside of those things where some you know you're, you're basically trying to reinvent the wheel um and uh as chesterton sort of put it you know where we evolve you know out of our clothes and into barbarianism you know so um yeah so i i, I am myself i'm totally nathan <laughs> i'm you know and i'm i'm a pretty i'm a pretty odd person um i would say that i'm a individual um but I have really strong roots. I know who I am. Um, and I think that, that those roots empower uh, rather than restrict. Um, so yeah, that's what I believe. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I think that parents should, parents should gift and protect and nurture um, identity. And if you'll do that, and you'll do that until you know and don't, you don't don't just do it until they're six or until they're nine or until they're 12 and then turn them loose uh do it until they're 18 right you know like um do it until they're 21 i mean my parents even when i was living in portland my, my parents had a, a pretty strong grip on on me you know telling me who i could date when i could date all that type of stuff even though i was you know you know, at that point, sort of doing whatever I wanted, but I was doing it, doing so fearfully. Um, sure. So it's just good. It's just it's healthy. These are healthy things. These, these, this is an ins the fa family is an institution that's like, <laughs> uh, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years, and it works. And uh, societies that will try to attempt to destroy it will be destroyed. Um, and people who who shirk their responsibility will in turn hurt people and hurt their own kids and hurt their own, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm big. I'm a I'm a strong believer in in strong family units um, and having a strong male figure um, in a home that sets the pace theologically, um, ideologically, philosophically. And that's my dad. My dad's a patriarch. I know that digital marketing is hard. Let's be honest. You're not great at it. Just because your youth pastor is young doesn't mean he should do it either. You need to trust the guys at the rocket.media to help you grow your church. They can help you get more first time guests each week with Google ads and market your big weekends like Christmas, Easter on Facebook and Instagram. They have invited over 25 million people to church using Google ads alone, and they just helped us launch our third location on the south side of Raleigh with over 400 people in attendance. So why don't you set up a free consultation right now? All you have to do is go to the rocket.media forward slash church and mention the Mike Santiago show. That's the rocket.media forward slash church. Mention us as a thank you for signing up. You'll get some free AirPods. Not a bad deal. Thanks, Rocket Media, for your support. That's amazing. 
Um, thank you for taking us back all the way through your childhood, letting us know how you value family. Where do you think this country, uh, America, the United States, where did we lose it when it comes to family? And is there any way of getting it back? Obviously, uh, God is in the business of resurrection and taking things that seem dead and turning them back to life. But when it comes to family in this country, where did we lose it and how do we get it back? Yeah. So um, I believe it was Chesterton, who was a Catholic, um, that talked about how, when, you know, when, when the last time that we thought that we had killed God, um, you know, he re resurrected three days later. And Christianity is absolutely, if you look historically at Christianity, it is a religion that resurrects. Um, I um, have recently become highly skeptical of Protestantism. Um, and my skepticism is coming from not that uh, Catholics have it all together or that, um, or that uh, you know, that I'm a Catholic convert because I'm not. Um, or uh, it, it really has to do with the deception that I think the Protestants are so uh, capable and culpable of. Um, like when I look at the, 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 the Protestant landscape in the United States, I, I look at a highly experience driven and deceived group of people. Um, I think that the scriptures are no longer, uh, the, the, the scriptures are just so uh, an aside and cultural idioms um, and cultural maxims and um, cultural instincts have so shaped and formed uh, the Protestant liturgy and purpose, uh, almost hijacked Protestant purposes. And this is, you know, Keller recently wrote um, a really cool piece uh, on the church that I read recently. I think it's about 10,000 words or maybe 20,000 words. And he sort of uh, sketches the rise and fall of mainline Protestantism and sort of where we're at right now. And basically he, his call is for a revival um, and uh, like a, a, a biblical revival, um, a revival of worship in the church, and essentially a, a, so, a, a brand new social vision. Um, but what I, and, and some of his points were really great. Um, others I, 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 I think he misdiagnosed. But what was really interesting to me was that, you know, the, 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 the rise and the fall of mainline Protestantism. And essentially, mainline Protestants became captivated by social issues of their day. And so uh, they, they stopped as something, the Protestants, you know, like the, for, for the reformers rather, the reformers believed that the church existed to worship God and to equip saints and to reach the world. That's Grudem. Um, but essentially the reformers, you know, when, when they left the Catholic church, they had to define what a church was. Like, how do we define what a church is? And so they define a church as wherever the gospel is preached faithfully and wherever the sacraments are administered. So really, administer is really important, and not just taken, but administered, right? So obviously that would be by a clergy, you know, um, think um, that would define a church. And at the beginning of the, of the, the 20th century, these churches stopped thinking of, uh, the church leaders stopped thinking of what defines a church and rather began to think of a church as a, a utility. Like, so what does it serve in society? And right. that became the highest, right? Like that became the highest goal. So when you hear people going, the church needs to get out, we need to get out of the four walls of the church. That's all, that idea is what got the Protestant, the mainline Protestant churches in trouble was because they, you know, okay, we've done the thing, we worship. Now we need to go and change the world. It's like, okay, so you never... If all the church did was worship God, that would be fulfilling its primary purpose. And you never leave that. You never leave the faith, the worship of God and the faithful teaching of scripture. Those things that they have to burn, you always keep fire on the altar constantly, right? And from those things, you fulfill your third purpose, you know, to, uh, to reach the world. But you have to keep, there's an order of priority. And I think what happened is the Protestant churches lost that priority. They began to see themselves as a utility. They adopted um, a metric, a false metric 
um, of what would make, you know, what would make the, that, that church of great utility. Um, and then they just became a utility and doctrine doesn't matter anymore. And worship doesn't matter anymore. And I think that that is what's happened to the family. Um, well, what's happened is essentially that there's these higher metrics and these higher truths that are, you know, love your neighbor, uh, or take care of the poor, you know, or, um, don't be mean, um, you know, always affirm people, love them. Um, and obviously these are, they're, 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 uh, they're unbiblical. They, they have a, they have a sort of a, a biblical vibe to them, um, but they're not really Bible. And right. the, you know, the, the, the core things that are like, you know, worship and, and the teaching of scripture and, and, and worship and teaching of scripture, that's what, that's where you, 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 know, you strong families are, are made and, and the strength of families are made. Um, that has been replaced by this, it's being replaced by these utilities, this overemphasis on the individual, the overemphasis on taking, um, you know, on, on, on kindness, you know, that the highest truth in our society is that we need to be kind to people who are, are, are completely confused in, in, in their gender. Uh, people that are completely confused on what are the, the purposes of a nation that are pe people that are completely fused, uh, you know, what pe people that affirm what's up is down and what's down is up. And, 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 and we need to affirm, you know, these things and, and the highest good of our society is kindness and, and nothing else matters. That's what's happened to the family. What's happened to the family is that we've incentivized fatherlessness um, financially um, mm. because we thought it was a good, we thought it was a kindness and we thought it was a mercy. You know, oh well, this 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 poor woman, she has, you know, she has seven children from seven different men. Let's let's give let's continue to give her money, um, you know, to incentivize um, this this social suicide, um, and um, and so ra rather than incentivize the family, incentive, you know, so so th that that to me is is what's happened is the the, the, the breakdown of the family is is because of the the. Uh, 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 the, the breakdown of the purpose of the church, the breakdown of the teaching of the church, the breakdown of, of, of a theology uh, of the church, um, and then ultimately this uh, this social engineering um, that has totally backfired. Um, and now we have, you know, of course we have these the education systems that are um, that Christians think are good, but Christians don't know what good is. Because they don't know their they don't the, theology, they don't know the Bible. Um, all they know what is good is they measure everything from a broken concept of love, um, and our leaders perpetuate these broken concepts. Uh, our pastors perpetuate these broken theological concepts, um, and so uh, there's great confusion. And the church is supposed to be the, the pillar of truth. It's supposed to be. Uh, it's we're, we're we're supposed to be the ones that are that are saying what is up and what is down and 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 now we we run from it and we and our highest truth is that people just feel like they're affirmed and loved and, and we don't talk about the truth in our church we just have a really great experience that gives you the fuzzies um when we talk about abortion uh we we talk in um we we make sure that the, the highest truth is that people feel validated Right. Not that the truth is spoken of. Um, you see, so everything is, but why would we do that? Because we've forgotten why the church exists. We, the, the, that the church exists to worship God and to equip the saints. And we've reversed the order. And now it's a utility to just, you know, scratch people's back um, and to affirm people in their hatred of God, in their rejection of God, in their embrace of, of, um, of, of an antichrist um, sentiment, um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, uh, an embrace of, of the devils of a, of a demonic theology, which is, uh, to, to, you know, to thine own self be true and do what thou will. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have a serious problem and I, I, bl I blame, I blame Protestantism for it, um, in a large part because Protestantism has enabled, um, a Christianity, a form of Christianity where there's no theological accountability where um, everybody is a, is, a, is a law unto themselves. Um, and the responsibility of Protestantism was that every believer is a priest. The, the priest or the believer was like a, a foundational truth 
of the reformers. Uh, but now we have a very lazy laity. And, um, and this is leaked into our clergy. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of pondering all these things at the moment. Well, I really appreciate you uh, letting us in to some of those thoughts and uh, let's kind of wrap up our time together with this. Maybe you can help a pastor watching this today. They want to be more bold in their proclamation of the gospel. They want to be more clear in their teaching and their theology. They want to be um, way more precise and and clear cut with where they stand, but they haven't taken that leap just yet. What are some things that maybe a young pastor or a pastor who feels like they're going to lose half their church if they make a statement on this, what would you say to equip and encourage a fellow minister looking to make that bold step? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so three thoughts. First thought is, is um, you're, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. So you will be pruned and the Lord will do the pruning. Okay, like Jesus walks, he still walks among the lampstands. Um, and so what you're going to be pruned by Jesus. So um, so are you going to do the pruning? Or is he going to have to do the pruning? You know, like, is your lampstand going to be removed? Or are you going to confront compromise in your church? Um, number one. Number two, um, if, if you own a company, and you have a bunch of people in your company that are bucking the system, hate the system, don't believe in the system. As a really great leader, what you do is you, you can, you, 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 you clean house and you get rid of the people who don't want to build in the same direction as you. That way, your company can quickly begin to win again. That's, right. that's what you do. You take stock. Why aren't we winning? Because people you know it's, it's like a football team, um, you know, where people aren't playing together. Why aren't people playing? They don't believe in the system. Okay. Well, either, well, then you, you get rid of the players who are the problem and then you bring in the players that are the problem. So if you have a church where, you know, half your church doesn't believe the gospel or it's half your church, you're, you are limiting the growth of your church. If you aren't confronting the issues and, so, you know, I have a ton of friends who about two years ago, they decided, yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel like I can't say what I'm supposed to say because I'm scared of losing my church. And they just, I don't care anymore. They just hit a point where I don't care. Right. And they lost, they lost the people that they needed to lose. And they have gained back in spades the people that are supposed to be there. You see, when you begin to lift your voice up, and you begin to prophesy, and you begin to create vision, God will begin to bring to you the people that you're supposed to have. Um, and, and so uh, that, that's, a David, that's a David leadership. A David leadership is, is a leadership that you know, creates the vision, and then people gather around it. Um, so I would say, do it, and do it quickly. Do it now. Don't wait you know, to build with people who don't want to build with you for three or four years, get rid of them now so that your growth can, can be um, accelerated. Um, and then thirdly, um, I would say um, that you have to rem remind yourself of why <laughs> you are doing what you're doing. You, you exist to please the Lord, not to please man. So, um, you know, are, are you a man pleaser? Are you a Saul? Or are you a God pleaser? You know? Um, so yeah, do not fear the people. Fear the Lord. Um, and if you are, in, and if you, if you, I would rather pastor a church of a hundred people and fear the Lord than pastor a church of a thousand people and have sold my soul and to become compromised. And I'm not saying that large churches have compromised. It's not because uh, I think that some of the best, some of the greatest pastors in America pastors huge churches. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I totally reject the idea that large churches are the problem. And the only reason why, you know, the only reason why this church is big is because he's compromised. No, that's not true. I know, I know some uncompromising Chris Hodges, uh, in my opinion, uh, Joe Champion, in my opinion, with lots, lots of, of pastors who are just, you know, not uncompromising and I'm thankful for them. Um, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, God doesn't, God doesn't, um, he doesn't measure churches by numbers. He, he, he weighs them, you know, how many Christians are in your church, right? You know? uh, and um, so, yeah, be a Christian, follow the Lord, be un, unflinching, um, be uncompromising, preach the word, uh, do essentially read first and second Timothy, get fired up, you know, and begin to, um, to be uncompromising. That's excellent. Well, I'm very grateful for your time. Again, um, I know it's valuable. You are a voice to many of us. And I don't know if you know the amount of group chats that just share your memes, screenshot your Instagram stories. And uh, we are forever, ever grateful for your influence and uh, for your teachings and for the resource that you provided the platform. And uh, so blessings on you and everything that you guys put your hands to. And thanks again for being on the show today. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a, it was a real privilege and an honor. Hey, did you love the show today? You can really help me out by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and hitting that like button. Commenting why you enjoyed today's episode, it's so helpful. The Mike Santiago Show is presented by Compassion International, produced by John Michael Sherman and the Rocket Media LLC. To find and follow Mike, all you have to do is go to the themikesantiagoshow.com right now. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.